All right, so the session is now being recorded. So welcome everybody to the teaching and learning call this morning, Wednesday, August 7th. My name is Trisha Gordon, I'm at UVA and I'm facilitating today's call. So welcome. And I would like to invite any of you who have announcements to come on your mics or type in the chat, um, any of the announcements you might have. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, there will be a MySQL upgrade for JIRA and Confluence later um, this evening. It's actually tomorrow morning, but it starts at uh, 10 p.m. Pacific, which is 1 a.m. Eastern. So it should last a couple hours. And um, after that, like tomorrow sometime, whenever you're up and using either Confluence or JIRA, if you notice any issues, please let me know and we can report that to our hosting partner. So again, that's going to happen um, early in the morning Thursday. Um, so just be aware of that. And also, um, and I'll paste the link into the notes. I do have one more um, focus group running at the end of this week on Friday. We're going to be talking about a kind of a variety of different potential um, time-saving enhancements uh, just to kind of get user feedback on those. So if you're interested in signing up for that, I will paste the link into the meeting notes. Thank you, Wilma. Anyone else have any announcements? Or, I believe there's probably a UX meeting after this one at 11. Is that right? Anybody on the call can verify that? I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure, this is Josh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there is. Yeah. And I think that there's going to be a report from Switch, which should be kind of interesting also. Oh, great. I'm sorry, I'll have to miss it. So I have, I have two other announcements, uh, okay. if I could. Um, one is from a roadmap perspective, you know, looking ahead to uh, Sakai 2020. I just wanted to let people know that the shared grading service is proceeding, proceeding apace. And, uh, you know, where Adrian and Earl and, and Wilma are all working on it in, in different kinds of ways. So that's, uh, we, we can expect, we can expect a shared grading service and, uh, you know, some kind of experimental improvements to the grading UI also for 2020. So that's kind of exciting. Um, the, the other thing is that um, I've been talking with, uh, a few folks about cloud storage integration. And it looks like uh, there may be opportunities, and this is, some of the details are still getting worked out a little bit, but I want to start to put the bug in people's ear. Uh, there may be opportunities for institutions to sponsor Google Drive integration. So I, I suspect what we'll see is that, uh, you know, a 50 hour project will be what's required to do Google Drive integration and it's something that, uh, that EDF can do, um, you know, so it's not all cast in stone, it's not all for sure, but if you're a Google school and you're out there and uh, you might have a little bit of funding at the start of the fiscal year to join with other schools in sponsoring this, uh, please, please reach out and say hi. Thanks, Josh, um, that's helpful. And this would, this, this would be for 2020, so I'm trying to, trying to rush this along a little bit. Oh, okay, yeah. Does anybody know when the freeze for that is? September 16th, 40 days. Okay. Earl has a little countdown thing that he uh, he uses at the, the core team meetings. Ah, September 19th, all right, thank you. Okay, I had a couple of requests to look at a couple of JIRAs. Uh, the first one, let me just paste the URL into the chat for folks. It's about bullhorn alerts and what what kind of alerts do we want from the forums tool. So um, let's take a minute and discuss that. Does anybody have any thoughts? I think Dave Evelyn may have sent this my way. I'm not sure. Um, Oh no, Sean, Sean Foster sent in my way. So interested in knowing which notifications from forums should show up in bullhorns. The developers need some direction on, on how to implement this. So if you don't have any thoughts right now, um, give, give it some thought and post your comments into the JIRA if you would.
Yeah, so just off the top of my head on this one, it seems like a course with a lot of form activity could get a little overwhelming with the alerts. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe if there's some way to like subscribe to certain topics for alerts um, or only get alerts on the messages, you know, that you're, the conversations you're involved mm -hmm. with or something like that. Yeah, that's a really good thought. Can you yeah, I think, I think actually, let's see, Dave mentioned something along those lines in the description. So I'll just comment with that. Okay. He did. He also suggested some kind of more of a, a summary notification mm. um, as a possibility that, okay, there has been activity in a particular topic, but not necessarily a new alert for every single post. Like a digest? Sort of thing kind of yeah just, just okay if somebody's posted in a particular topic okay you get a little flag for that yeah yeah I, I, I agree it could get a little too chatty good good suggestions and uh, are we ready to move on anybody else have any suggestions about that Lucy's not using it, but agrees with Wilma, and so do I. There's one other JIRA. Let me paste that URL in. And I'm not sure who put this in. Yeah, I added that one. Oh, okay. Great. <laughs> um, it was just a question about um, question pools and the behavior for rubrics. So uh, right now, it lets you attach a rubric to a question pool item, but it doesn't copy into the assessment or really do anything. Um, and so the question is, should they even be allowed in question pools? Um, or, you know, should it just only be in assessments? You know, that sort of thing. So I was thinking that because the grading happens in the assessment, not the pool, that it made more right. sense to have it in only the assessment, not allow it in pools. But I don't know if folks are looking to copy, you know, a rubric along with and, you know, how that would work from the pool. So I, I think that could be problematic because question pools are tied to a user, whereas the rubric is tied to a course. And if you pull a question with a rubric into a course that doesn't have that that was initially tied to to some rubric into a course that doesn't have that rubric how's that going to work or if the rubrics yeah. tool isn't installed in that course it, does it just get ignored or, or does it cause a problem I'm not sure how how that yeah, could be, how that could even be done um, not being a programmer I don't know maybe it's easier than I think it might be but that seems like it's that it's a on it. big can yeah, of that's one. an excellent point um, so I think just yeah. to the easiest path forward is just don't let them do it in pools. <laughs> I, I, I agree because I think that is fraught with peril. <laughs> just okay. What I know about question pools, it's kind of a mess and, and uh, I, I agree. I think it should be at the assessment level. Okay. Although I, I have to say, I mean, I just, I just want to, you know, I don't have an, an actual opinion on this except to say that, you know, it, it, as, as I hear this, we're limiting ourselves by what we think may be hard or easy for the developers, I mean, which is a, a reasonable filter, but it probably would be good also to envision what we would want to have happen, you know, if all things were possible, because without that kind of a set of goalposts, we can't really figure out where we need to be going. And it could be that that the, the right thing to do is exactly what you've described, um, but if uh, if we haven't yet articulated the right thing, only what we think will be easier from a development perspective, then maybe we ought to articulate the right thing. Yeah. If Tiffany were on the call, which she's not, <laughs> I, I know, I know she could I'm sure she would have an opinion. <laughs> well, she, she would probably yeah, have some insights about the question pool um, dilemma uh, with this that that could inform you know, with more sound reasoning than just it seems like a bad idea. 
maybe she could either write the list or comment on the JIRA and sort of write the list about the JIRA to, to seed the conversation. I can ask her to take a look and comment. I'd be happy to do that. I, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a bad idea. I just, I just think it would be horrendously complicated to implement because I'm, I keep thinking of more things. It's like, well, what if you transfer a question pool? Does the rubric go along with it? You know, what if, what if you share a question pool? There's, there's, there's a lot of things to think about in how that would be implemented to make it work. Right. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, the thing I keep coming back to is, is what would be the purpose of having the rubric in the pool to begin with? Because you're yeah. not grading anything there. That's right. But, but if I, I understand the reasoning, because if, if you, if you want to use a rubric to grade a short answer question, if it's being, if those questions are being pulled from a question pool, then you can't use the rubric to grade it unless it was somehow attached. And I'm not yeah. sure. Well, once you put it into the assessment, you can attach the rubric to it. Yeah, I guess you could. Because um, if you pull in like a random question set, you but, can't but put you, a, yeah. I don't think you can put a rubric on that. Right. Mm -hmm. Unless it's like in the intro or something, but. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I think you'd, I don't see how it could be added to the pool directly. I, you'd think it, I would think it would have to be added. I wonder if once you publish the quiz and you edited the question, you could then put a rubric on it. I might have to try that. But, but could you still grade by an attached rubric? I don't know the answer to that. I'm well, going to check it out. Has to be, the rubric has to be attached to the question, and you can only right. attach it to certain question types. Okay. So it, it'll be like a short answer essay or um, file upload or student audio response. Oh, you can um, do it for so, all of those. Okay. Yeah. So it has to be one of those question types to be mm -hmm. able to attach a rubric. Okay. Um, so, yeah. I'll ask Tiffany to take a look at that um, JIRA, but my gut reaction is just don't do it. <laughs> and that's just my opinion, but my no. not very technically informed opinion. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not against doing it. I'm just not sure if it's doable. Right. Well, we need to move on. So um, thanks for bringing those Jira's forward, and uh, right now we're going to turn to Clea Mahoney at NYU, who gave a wonderful presentation at Open Aperio um, called Treat Them Like Students. And I'm very delighted to introduce Clea and invite her to present her topic again. Welcome, Clea. Thank you so much, Tricia. Um, just making sure that everyone can hear me okay. We can hear you fine. Thanks. Awesome. And thanks again for the opportunity to present. Um, as I was getting situated in Big Blue Button this morning, I was telling Tricia that, like many of us, I'm sure this is kind of our busiest time, you know, preparing for the fall semester. Um, but reading over my notes from this presentation, which I gave now over two months ago, can't believe it's flown by. Um, it brought me back to really why I work so hard, why I ultimately love what I do, and I hope to share that with some of you today. And so the presentation during Aperio was pretty interactive. Um, I'd like the focus today to be more of kind of what I presented about and how the audience reacted at the time um, so that we have more time for questions and answers, if that's all right. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and um, stop sharing my webcam so you can focus on the presentation. So a little bit more about me. Um, I'm Clea Mahoney, Instructional Technology Specialist and Training Lead for NYU IT. I work in a place called Digital Studio, which is housed in the beautiful Central Library. Um, and I focus mainly on Sakai training, which we call NYU classes here. But before I went more into why I was here and what I wanted us to accomplish during a period, uh, I did a quick poll using Poll Everywhere to find out who's in the room. And so we can do an adapted version of that. Um, just share in the chat which of these titles best describes your role. And the options were educational technologist, support staff, 
faculty or instructor, instructional designer, library or library support, teaching assistant, technology director, and the eponymous other. <laughs> and I know that you might wear many of those hats, so maybe just pick one that most resonates with you. Awesome, so I can see that there's a mix in here, and I wonder if any of you play any hand when it comes to technical training uh, for faculty. Awesome. Uh, so a little bit more about me. Uh, 10 years ago, embarrassingly, I pursued a degree in uh, library and information science because I loved learning, but I really wanted just to hide behind some books and websites all day. I never sought out to go into this role of technical training and leading presentations, but now that I'm in it, I really love it and I've won some prizes and accolades. At my last institution, Columbia University School of Professional Studies, I was recognized as the Administrator of the Year. And at NYU, I've won two IT Excellence Awards for training and communication initiatives. And so a little bit more about the title of this presentation. When I was at Columbia, a program director once asked me if I was attending a faculty meeting. And when I explained that I don't teach, she responded, but you're the teacher of teachers. And she might as well have called me Khaleesi, mother of dragons. It was that much of a foreign concept. And this was also much more relevant when we were in the depths of Game of Thrones during the conference. Um, but over the past two and a half years, I've really come to accept and embrace this role of teacher. And this quote on Twitter on the right uh, from a faculty development superstar that I follow captures how I feel. So Jesse Stommel says, recently I described my profession as teaching teachers, and one response I got back was a declarative, faculty aren't students. And so in reflecting on this, he says that the idea that faculty aren't students reduces teaching to something less than a craft, an art, an area of study, a philosophical project. It's one explanation for why the majority of higher ed faculty get zero direct preparation for the work of teaching. And I firmly believe that preparation in using technology in their teaching is a big part of that. So in this presentation, I'm going to share strategies for supporting my students and their students in educational technology training through the lens of adult learning and including the student perspective. I'm now so immersed in my role as a trainer that I've come to assign learning objectives to nearly everything I do. And of course, this presentation was not an exception. Uh, so here's where I'd like to take us, if you're willing to come along for the ride. And I'll have the first one be more as a takeaway activity uh, for the interest of time. But ultimately, I want, to, I want you to create a model to teach faculty at your institution. Recognize opportunities for timely and targeted virtual training, which has been a, a big win for us here at NYU. And identify ways to incorporate the student perspective. In preparing this presentation for Perio, I had some false starts and crazy ideas, uh, one of which was a mnemonic device where each letter of the word students represented my approach to training. Luckily, my husband offered constructive criticism and told me you'd all be counting down the letters <laughs> waiting for me to finish. But I really want to find a way to make this work and to tie all of my lessons learned into a memorable framework. And so in thinking about that quote earlier, I chose the word teach. We haven't formally adopted this as a model for training, but the teach model does represent what we do in the NYU digital studio. And you'll notice as I explain it, that it's much more about EQ than IQ, about connecting with our learners versus sharing deep, detailed technical expertise. So this is my session. And as I mentioned, uh, a takeaway is to ask you to come up with one of your own. And these principles here represent my goals for all faculty training sessions. So first, T is for transformation. Really, the goal of any training is behavior change rather than just a straight information dump. But I also want to transform how faculty think about technology, going beyond their own application to how it's going to impact their students. I also create more work for myself uh, by transforming my training after each session, incorporating participant feedback. 
One specific piece of feedback that I've pushed back against uh, in a handful of training feedback survey comments is faculty wanted me to do a pause so I can follow along in my own course site approach when I do webinars. And if you found a way to make this work without boring, losing, or frustrating the rest of the audience, please let me know. I just don't think it can be done in a one hour webinar. And I'm just going to take a sip of my coffee here. So E is for empathy. It's so important for me to connect with faculty, especially as someone who has, hasn't actually taught any higher ed courses. In the book, Compelling People, the authors argue that unless you find a way to get into the inner circle of your audience, they're going to ignore you. So I focus on connecting and empathizing with my learners and then sharing the information. Sometimes I do this by including characters like Professor Dumbledore teaching Harry Potter 101 for my That's a Wrap training session, which focuses on all the little things you need to do to finalize your Sakai gradebook at the end of the semester. And this is actually a screenshot um, that one of my former student workers created. Um, I'm so proud of what she did. You know, she did neat things like renaming messages tool to Alpost, and we just had a lot of fun with it. Next A is for andragogy. And I can debate all day whether it should be pronounced andragogy or andragogy, but that's neither here nor there. Um, applying adult learning principles to my training is so important. And I ask myself if my goals and content meet my learners' needs through this lens each and every time. The Malcolm Knowles book cited down here, uh, The Adult Learner, is a great resource, but honestly, I haven't finished it. And so for something more digestible, mm -hmm. I recommend LinkedIn Learning's course on instructional design for adult learners. It's a great one that I return to regularly. I won't go into depth on the principles of adult learning, but to quickly summarize, I focus on why instructors need to know the technology, give them choices on the tools and techniques that support their pedagogy and subject matter, and draw on their prior experience with learning management systems because I've seen and administered quite a few of them now. I offer the training when they're getting ready for their course. I focus on a problem solving orientation to learning and I draw on their intrinsic motivation, at least I hope, to run the course and help their students succeed. Last but not least, C is for coaching. At the digital studio, we do our best not to do work for faculty. We empower them to learn how to do things themselves. And I hate to say it, but this is in direct opposition to the approach of my prior institution, where we did much more for faculty, thinking that they just wouldn't take the time to do it. And, you know, it's easier just to do it ourselves. But to my great surprise, a coaching approach actually works. And more importantly, it's scalable. Yes, sometimes it's painful to see the slow moving of a mouse or guide an instructor to click just a little bit more to the right, but the payoff is immense. And finally, H is for help. Above all, at the digital studio, we want faculty to know that they're not alone. And this often means pointing them towards other resources on campus, such as their local instructional technology support staff. But it also leads to follow-up one-on-one consultations conducted in person or online with uh, my team at the digital studio. This helps avoid information overload in my training sessions and strengthens our relationship beyond that one hour training. And something that I wanna do more in the future uh, to grow training services at NYU is to encourage peer learning and support. I really wanna empower faculty to answer each other's questions and speak to their shared experiences in teaching with technology. So at the end of the session, as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to challenge you to come up with your own teach model to rethink or refine the work that you do related to training. But before we get there, I'd like to share two specific strategies that have helped me take training to the next level. And that is timely training through webinars and emphasizing the student perspective. I think probably all of us on this call can relate to the biggest barrier for faculty training, which is time. Many of us have spent countless hours preparing action-packed in-person workshops, only to have a handful of people show up if they show up at all. 
personally, I still really love in-person training, particularly more for troubleshooting aspects and observing my learners. But I have to think about who's not in the room when I run these training sessions and how I'm not reaching them. We really struggle with this at NYU due to our distributed campus in a huge city, Big Apple, <laughs> as well as global sites, including London, Abu Dhabi, and Florence. And I've actually trained faculty in all of those locations. After just one semester of comparing the registration and attendance numbers for face-to-face um, -face in person versus online sessions, it became obvious that webinars were going to give me more bang for my buck. And what you don't see here in the numbers are that I actually canceled three in-person training sessions each semester due to low enrollment. Now looking ahead to fall 2019, um, I'm pretty overwhelmed at the moment and surprised I haven't lost my voice yet because I have 23 training sessions coming up and I'm mostly a team of one with a few amazing student workers, but I'll get there. And maybe, you know, fingers crossed, I get to cancel some. But ultimately, faculty time constraints come directly from who they are, right? They're busy professionals, they're juggling multiple commitments as faculty, and even more so if they are adjuncts who work full-time and teach at several institutions. And I really love focusing on adjunct support because I feel that at most institutions, um, it's just not a focus in faculty development. And so I time my sessions to match the semester crunch. Around two to three weeks before classes start, I offer one hour webinars targeted to specific goals like setting up a simple course site, organizing that site with a lessons tool, and dealing with the gradebook as a whole separate beast. And I don't even touch tests and quizzes or forums right now, but I do let faculty know about those tools so that if they're interested, they can reach out. These webinars typically take place midday, which works as a virtual lunch and learn and also works for a few other global locations, although I'm thinking about adding in more sessions for different time zones in the future. And reflecting on those RSVP numbers and thinking about who didn't make it to the training session, you know, life happens, things get in the way, I record those sessions and I track views in our Kaltura channel. I'm also working on creating some microlearning videos for just in time on your own learning and of course, I'm trying to do this at the same time as I'm launching 23 training sessions. And I really can't believe it, but most of those videos are gonna be ready in time for the fall semester. I'm oh, sorry, I wanted to share one more story um, from a faculty because I don't watch my own webinar recordings. I'm too embarrassed. Um, but I met with one uh, kind of 11th hour adjunct who was hired you know, a few days before he's scheduled to teach this class. And after our initial one hour consultation at the digital studio, I sent him a link to my webinar recordings and said, hey, you might wanna check these out before we meet next time to set up your course site. And to my surprise, he actually did watch them and gave me the highest praise that I really could ask for. He said that he had all these questions about NYU classes as he was going through the webinar, but I actually answered them during the recording. So um, to me, that gives me an indication that I know what faculty are thinking about, I know what's important to them, at least to that one person, it really made me feel great. Two resources that have helped me take my webinars to the next level, and I'm always looking to improve them, are the books Interact and Engage and the Successful Virtual Classroom. They're more framed for corporate learning, but I think that's actually perfect for faculty training because in both contexts, we're dealing with career-focused adult learners. I got the idea of a welcome tour from the book Interact and Engage, which is essentially an orientation to the virtual video conferencing platform. In our case, I use Zoom, and so I help them connect to audio, video, use the chat feature for uh, kind of a low stakes icebreaker breaker activity. And that's really helped me make sure that, you know, everyone is engaged and participating. And the book, successful, The Successful Virtual Classroom, is really great if you're looking for strategies for adapting in-person um, training experiences to online. It'll give you a lot of ideas. Now, of course, uh, there's one major downside to my webinars, at least as I see it, and that is there's not much opportunity to practice and observe. To address this, I target my learning objectives for the webinars at the lower levels of Bloom's taxonomy, and I make it clear that instructors are going to need to practice what we review together. Just as they can't expect their students to master course content on day one, 
Uh, they're not going to become pros at Sakai overnight, and that is okay, and I want them to know it's okay. There's so many opportunities for practice, from in-person and virtual consultations at the studio, to putting them in touch with local support and our 24-7 central help desk. And also, of course, sharing step-by-step -step guides in our publicly available, publicly available knowledge base. This approach helps me save time by focusing the content of the specific training session, and also lets me personalize the learning experience to avoid that dreaded one-size-fits-all approach. So I focus on what's going to be the most helpful to most people, but let them know if they want to target individual goals, you know, to continue the learning with us. And so during the conference, I launched this open-ended poll and I took some screenshots of it uh, because I was really curious what challenges others faced regarding online training at their institution. So if you all want to participate in real time, um, go ahead and uh, share some comments in the chat. I can read that. I hope the clunking noises in the background are not from me, but I am in an open office and hope I'm not annoying my coworkers too much. So some people share things like face-to-face uh, -face training can be boring too. That is absolutely true. It can be less engaging as a viewer, very true. And that's why um, I have a lot of strategies for engaging my audience during the session, which I'm happy to tackle in Q&A after this. And as you can see, there were a lot of challenges, um, but I'm excited about these. I think mostly all of them can be addressed. So now I wanna switch gears to talking about the student perspective. Most of the faculty I meet want their students to grow, learn, and succeed in the course. And so I hone in on that intrinsic motivation, hashtag adult learning principle, by emphasizing the design and structure of their course site as well as the guidance that they're gonna give their students, like how to navigate the course site and how to submit assignments. The goal is to get faculty to empathize and connect with their learners, focusing equally on pedagogy and technology. And here's where I introduce you to my amazing team of student workers, which unfortunately now is just down to two. Uh, my star student, Arono, is working abroad. Yuna graduated, but we might be hiring her here. Um, so I, I teared up a little bit looking at the slide this morning because I miss them so much. My team trains our student consultants on the instructor side of Sakai, and it's always surprising to them how much power instructors have over the system. And they're curious too, you know, they often ask, why don't more instructors use the gradebook or the lessons tool? They're so helpful for me in uh, staying on track throughout the semester. So their curiosity, passion for helping faculty, and identities as students are the key ingredients for access, successful consultation. And I'm a baker, so I like to think of this as using the highest quality chocolate, butter, and flour for making a cake. Sure, you can get something edible if you're on a budget, but those top quality ingredients make the final product so much more memorable. And I have a video here, which I'll link out in the chat afterwards, but essentially it's uh, a student's perspective of NYU classes. And I hope that it works equally as a faculty motivator in um, showing them that, you know, the power of helping students explore this content in their course site. I love having students join me in a consultation because quite often the instructor asks them, you know, what do you think about all of this? And suddenly they have a much more compelling reason for using a certain tool or technique. And thank you for sharing the link uh, to the video, Trisha. So here's about where we wrapped up for the presentation. And I mentioned at the time that there's so much to do and see and absorb at conferences. And I normally leave with memories of fantastic presentations, new resources and new connections that all gets buried under a sea of emails when I get back to the office and then it's gone. So in bringing us back to the beginning, um, I urge you to create your own teach model to transform your technical training. But you don't have to use the word teach. So we launched into a word cloud poll of other words that people might want to use. I love that someone threw my name as the model for a poll. Help. Um, this long word that I'm not going to <laughs> attempt to pronounce. And some really funny ones like prayer. <laughs>
And during the session, I actually gave out little uh, NYU classes, phone chargers as prizes to get people to do this. And although I try to focus on intrinsic motivation, the extrinsic part certainly helps and people started participating as soon as I show them those prizes. So there's a bit.ly link uh, to the teach model. It's basically a, a Google document and you can fill it out. You can use the word teach, you can use something else. Uh, ultimately, it's just to think about what you can bring to training that's not just focusing on a straight technical how-to dump. And I'd like to wrap up um, just by thanking my colleagues for all of their support in my sometimes off the wall training ideas. Um, above all though, I wanna thank my amazing student employees for encouraging me to think deeply about the student perspective and faculty training, because that's really why many of us work in higher ed, to support students' learning and growth. I've grown so much because of my students, and I'm super grateful. And these are some resources that I used uh, to prepare for this presentation. Well, Clea, I think you've done an amazing job. Um, and I love your teach model. I think I think that really helps to um, focus your your um, training of faculty. And of course, yeah, and it helps me bring myself out of the weeds and focus on you know what I'm really trying to accomplish here, which is just get them to feel more comfortable with technology. Right, and connected to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I'm I'm sorry. I was typing something when you were mentioning what topics you focused on at the beginning of the semester. Could you repeat that for me? Oh yeah, sure. And um, I can show you to a, a preview of, of what's coming up this semester because oh, yeah. it's different. It's beyond just NYU classes. Um, but typically I do a, a getting started session which focuses on like logging, logging in, navigating the interface, and setting up the basics of a course site um, from the syllabus and resources to updating that overview homepage um, to not just be a boring wall of text. And then I kind of um, get them to think about other tools that they might want to use. Like if you're already building out your resources, why not take the next step and use lessons to organize and sequence that content? Um, I definitely focus on the gradebook as well and primarily just the connection between structuring the gradebook and setting up assignments um, for folks who are more interested in tests and quizzes and a little bit more advanced grade book stuff, I encourage uh, follow-up consultations for that. that is uh, great. Let me see if I can bring up a page of my training sessions. And then my next question to follow on to that is, do you break these down a little bit? So do you include grade book in, in the initial getting started for example or do you do a separate session on that i talk about the gradebook but then that's really just an invitation to get them to sign up for gradebook gotcha. training or to do okay. a one-on-one -on -one consultation okay gotcha i'm just gonna pull up my training for faculty and staff page and then i can paste a link in there sorry my mouse is not cooperating <laughs> Here we go. Oh, great. So in addition to those training sessions, I do a little bit of outreach with our local school technologists. And so for example, for the Tandon School of Engineering, uh, I somehow agreed to six separate training sessions. <laughs> they focus mm -hmm. primarily on getting started with NYU classes and uh, teaching online with Zoom, which is uh, a big tool that we're starting to use more. So there are sessions on yeah. Zoom. There are sessions on learning analytics. We have our own in-house team, which works on that. Uh, a getting started orientation. Um, wow, let me see what cool. else. Uh, one that I'm really excited about is teaming up with our director of accessibility. Uh, we're focusing on creating accessible course content. And the goal is just to get faculty to start, you know, small things to structure their documents rather than scaring them with lawsuits about accessibility or thinking about all those things like color contrast and various technologies you might have to use um, just to help them you know identify with uh, the challenges that some of their learners might have and also to focus on good principles of design yeah 
So I'm curious for the folks that are on this call, if any of you are doing something similar to what Clea has described. Yeah, I always love to get ideas from people. Um, and I'll put my Twitter handle in the chat because that's where I, I learn a lot. That's okay. my, my PLN. <laughs> Thank you, Clea. Yeah, sure. You might see occasional rants and pictures of my cats. <laughs> What's our staffing level at NYU for Sakai? So uh, this is pretty interesting. We have kind of tier one, which is our help desk, um, and they cover NYU classes as well as pretty much everything at NYU, right? Like how to get connected to Wi-Fi, classroom technology, beyond. Um, if they can't handle it, we have a tier two team that has a little bit more technical expertise in classes. And I'm actually running a, a training session for them in the fall, along with my boss to, to cover what's new and just ensure they're prepared. We have some new staff there. And then my team is tier three. Um, we used to be, I think, six to eight. We're about half the team that we need to be right now. So we're going through a hiring process. Um, and that's another reason that I'm kind of panicking for the fall, but just gonna do the best <laughs> we can. <laughs> and then we also have a technical team. Um, many of you might know uh, Kyle Blythe and Jeff Pash. Sure, we sure do. Most of us, I think. It was yeah. funny because um, I was at the conference with Kyle, and someone just heard his voice, and they're like, "That voice, it's Kyle." So he's a little bit like our local Madonna, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we recognize his voice from a really awesome video he did for when Sakai Eleven was released, I believe. So. Yeah, he's my voiceover hero. I would, yeah. I, I think you should just do audiobooks. I know, <laughs> he'd be great at it. And Josh says the accessibility content would be really helpful for many people in the community and hopefully you'll be able to share as it comes together. That would be really cool. Yeah, I'd love to share it. The main things that we're gonna focus on in that webinar are, um, there's an add-on for Google called Grackle. So just running Grackle through people's presentations and documents, making sure that things like headings and alt text are added. Um, I'm focusing on the, we call it accessibility assistant in NYU classes. Uh, so again, catching those common mistakes. Yeah, cool. Any other questions from our attendees today? I wish we could clone you, Clea, to all of our individual <laughs> oh, trust me. That, and I'll share a link to um, the presentation here if anyone wants to visit it later. Thank you. That's excellent. I will say um, one recommendation if you are exploring virtual training are to get as much help as possible. Uh, so I used to try to do everything myself and now I'm getting a little bit better at delegating. Um, I have some of the students help me with administrative logistics, but I also have one of them serve as uh, my co-host, or I like to use the term um, co-pilot, <laughs> or yeah. flying the plane virtually, um, yeah. and to kind of keep an eye on the chat, um, keep things moving along, make sure the oh. audience is engaged. Uh, yeah. That really helps a lot. That does help a lot. Um, that's really good advice. So Katie Reynolds says, I think one thing that helps with online training is to keep it as interactive as possible, just as we would to keep a class interactive so yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely and, and that's you a challenge for me because i'm like i have so much information i need to share i just need right. to talk as quickly as possible and so i continuously have to remind myself to step back and you know involve them more throughout the way so you mentioned that when you you sort of get them going at the beginning of the um of each webinar i wonder if you could give a tip or two on on how you do engage them to be a little bit more interactive and not just sitting there quietly yeah yeah i like to use polling um uh i like to use the chat feature a lot so they can see what other people are saying um like for my uh getting started with any way you classes training session i'm asking how are they teaching and then i offer something that might be a little bit controversial and say you know, even though I think most people who, who join these sessions teach face to face, I'm going to say that actually I think you're all teaching online to some degree. And, you know, you can use these technologies, even if, even if you're not running a fully online course, uh, to make the most of in class time or to connect with your students between those class sessions. Yeah. And I see there's a question about uh, what do you do about faculty who are interested in learning or using Sakai? So they tend to not register for my webinar. I did have one person um, who attended two different sessions and she said, I did a great job, but that 
Sakai just doesn't meet her needs for her uh, flipped learning Russian classroom course. <laughs> I asked her to elaborate a little bit and I wanted to, you know, see if we could get at that, but um, I think she just wasn't interested, unfortunately. Interesting. So we're not going to win everyone, um, right. but we have a pretty good adoption rate of Sakai. Uh, at least instructors are using it to, to some degree because every section of a course comes with a course site that's just waiting to be activated. Um, so I try to encourage them, you know, you don't have to go all out, but you can use this at least to, to make some small changes and share information and, and help your students. Yeah, I've seen some um, presentations from from other institutions who um, were doing training, and some of them actually offered badges to mm, their yeah. instructors to sort of incentivize them. And it, and I haven't done that myself. Um, I've been very interested in it, but I just haven't wrapped my head around it. Um, as a way to sort of um, engage with people who might be reluctant. Otherwise. Yeah, I'm interested in that too. Um, I heard a, a presentation from at another conference from the team at Rutgers teaching and learning with technology, mm -hmm. and they said they've successfully used badges, but even more um, popular than badges were just these like Word document, you know, certificates. It didn't take really? them a lot of work, but faculty really wanted like an artifact for their, uh, you know, professional development portfolio really? or to so use for tenure so something that they can add to their uh, CV or resume yeah interesting it's so funny at the one session that I saw about the badges they mentioned that instructors were like when are we going to be able to earn a new badge you know they were like eager <laughs> yeah I think um <laughs> the analog version that I like to use is stickers. Like no one is too old yeah. for stickers. Oh. I still get excited about stickers. I have them all over my laptop. <laughs> and yeah, I see Kathy is sharing, um, you know, there's some who don't even want to learn. They won't come to one on one. I don't know how to reach those people. But I think if you have an opportunity to, to talk to them and try to figure out like what's stopping them, what's, right. what's blocking them. What's the resistance? Mm -hmm. And Katie Reynolds has asked that question. Um, how do you, has anyone done a targeted invite by identifying who doesn't utilize Sakai? Oh, I know, I don't, we haven't at UVA. That's a no, tough one. No, we haven't either. That is a tough one. But I do tend to get a lot of new faculty. Um, we could do a, a definitely a better job at outreach. Uh, we don't invite all faculty because our university is pretty protective about you know how many emails we send to faculty, which I totally oh, get. Right. Uh, so for my training sessions, I really rely on word of mouth, and I've had some instructors or, or program directors help spread the word. Um, yeah, but I think in many cases, what drives the new faculty to to join these sessions is they're probably panicking a little bit, right? And yeah, they think that they're expected to get up to speed in a few hours, and Very so it's a good opportunity yeah. to help them. Absolutely, that's excellent. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we all have stories we could share and tips of things that have worked well, and also maybe some cautionary tales of things that haven't worked very well. This has been oh, yeah. really great. Really appreciate you joining us today, Clea. Thank you. Oh, yeah. so Thanks so much for having me. Absolutely. We have just a few minutes left. And uh, I just wanted to mention that our next meeting is on August 21st. Then when Bishop Maris is going to join us for, uh, to present on her presentation on Innovate Plus Beyond Your Online Course. So, um, that oh, yeah, I saw, I saw that presentation yeah. at Aperio, so that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did not get to see it, so I'm looking forward to that one. And then we have some open dates in September. Um, so, folks, if, if you have any suggestions um, for presentations or you have something you want to present yourself, please let me know or reach out to Matt Burgess or even Wilma. Um, any of us would be glad to help get you on the schedule. So, Tricia, on the 18th, I could probably do an update on the grading UI, um, centralized oh, grading. Oh, wonderful. Stuff. Okay, I'm going to put you down for that. Excellent. Thank you, Wilma. Okay, great.
And um, let's see, is it time for a Jirapalooza? Charles, I, I think it's getting close to time. Um, if not on the September 4th meeting, then early in October, I'm guessing. So um, yes, and Laura Geckler points out that this presentation was very timely for the rest of us who are gearing up for our faculty training as well. So oh, again, a big thanks to you, Clea. And we look forward to seeing you again at another Open Aperio, hopefully. Yeah, thank you so much for the invite. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Okay, folks, um, if anybody has any other announcements or topics to bring up quickly before we adjourn, um, come on your mic or chat and let us know. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and adjourn.